A pleasant day, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we will be jump-starting the La Salle Sustainability Lecture Series for 2023. We will have the first of the lecture series for this year. But before we officially start the lecture series, may I invite you for a brief prayer. Let us put ourselves in the presence of our Lord. Dr. Arish, you're on mute. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Abiso. Uh, as we start our lecture series for this year, uh, we will have a brief uh, overview of the lecture series. Uh, this will be delivered by Dr. Raymond Tan, the Vice President for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University. Dr. Tan is joining us uh, in our Zoom meeting. Uh, currently is in, he is currently mobile. So I will be uh, sharing the prepared video of Dr. Tan. Ladies and gentlemen, good day. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first talk of the 2023 Sustainability Lecture Series. I'm Raymond Tan. I'm the Vice President for Research and Innovation of De La Salle University in Manila, Philippines. The Sustainability Lecture Series is a joint initiative of the International Association of La Salle Universities, which is a global network of higher education institutions linked by a common La Salle heritage. The series is 
is implemented in cooperation with De La Salle University, my institution, which proudly considers itself as an emerging research university. Having been founded as De La Salle College in 1911, having been transformed into university in 1975, DLSU prides itself not just as a quality educational institution, but as a producer of cutting edge knowledge as evidenced by our rapid growth in research activity and output in the previous decade. The lecture series finds inspiration in two documents. First is the 2015 encyclical from Pope Francis, known as Laudato Si, which calls on the Catholic world to re-examine lifestyles and to redirect towards more sustainable pathways. Second is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which provides 17 broad developmental goals, time bound to the year 2030, which together provide a roadmap of development for many countries throughout the world. Both documents provide ample guidance for us to direct our efforts in our respective institutions towards a more sustainable future for our descendants. The lecture series was initially conceived in the early days of the pandemic. The core group uh, comprised of Dr. Kathleen Aviso, the Dean of Engineering at De La Salle University, Dr. Carmelita Quebenco, Chancellor Emeritus of De La Salle University, Dr. Alvin Colaba, the Director of the Center for Engineering and Sustainable Development Research, and myself. Now, we may recall that in the midst of the early pandemic in 2020, there were mobility restrictions imposed in many countries throughout the world. And we thought that uh, modern technology does provide a very good platform for us to reach out across oceans and share our ideas through virtual events. And thus, in early 2021, we launched this lecture series. The talks deal with diverse topics related to sustainable development, and the lectures were held mostly on the last Wednesday of each month with some adjustments. And of course, we've had to contend with the time zone challenges when having events involving people from the Americas, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, and really uh, deal with that in a way that addresses the needs of the different speakers and audience members. The lectures have always been streamed via Zoom, but we've provided an avenue for alternative viewing via YouTube. And it's significant to note that we've also set up a dedicated YouTube channel for the lecture series. This was initially intended to allow for asynchronous viewing if uh, time zone considerations made live viewing uh, inconvenient for the audience. But this is also allowed for delayed viewing. And uh, recently, we've looked at the lectures that are available on the channel, which is almost all of the lectures to date. And uh, these have accumulated uh, more than 5,000 views from people all over the world. And the number, of course, is still growing. And uh, over the years, we've had resource persons from the global IALU network, from Latin America, North America, Europe, Africa, and of course, Asia. And I'm happy to note that our two colleagues today, uh, first of all, our host, Dr. Aris Ubando, has himself uh, co-hosted previous lectures in this series. And our speaker, Ms. Ria Migo Sumagang, uh, previously had hosted a couple of these lectures and now takes center stage as our speaker today. So as we look forward to the forthcoming end of this uh, global health crisis. We will see some adjustments in 2023. For instance, uh, we may adjust the frequency of the lecture series because of the logistical challenges of uh, changing work arrangements in different parts of the world. Uh, but definitely we intend to sustain this lecture series over the coming year. At the same time, we will eventually experiment with at least a hybrid delivery of some of the future lectures 
instead of the purely virtual ones that we've had to date. And of course, all these announce announcements will be made via our uh, various contacts in our IALU member institutions. So with that, of course, I'll conclude these brief remarks and we do look forward to a sustainable future, not just for the Lasallian community, but for the entire planet. Good day to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan, for a very brief introduction of the lecture series for 2023. Okay, allow me to share my screen again. Uh, let's proceed now to the lecture proper. To start off this lecture series, we have the first of the lecture series for 2023, and the lecture is entitled Optimization of Negative Emissions Technology Portfolios Using Process Integration Techniques. Our speaker for today is uh, Assistant Professor Maria Victoria Migo Sumagang, and uh, allow me to introduce her in a, in a while. Uh, but uh, to provide some information about the webinar, our speaker would be uh, giving us a discussion of the various negative emission technology and how this can be an effective pathway for sustainability and risk reduction. Our speaker is an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines, uh, Los Baños, and also a PhD candidate at De La Salle University. She has obtained her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering uh, with a magna cum laude award and in MS in mechanical engineering with an academic achievement award from UP. Los Baños. She is currently under the Engineering Research for Development and Technology PhD Scholarship Program of De La Salle University. She is a registered associate ASEAN engineer and an associate member of the National Research Council of the Philippines. She has received the 2021 College of Engineering and Agro-Industrial Technology Outstanding Junior Faculty Award from UP Los Baños. Her current research involves the application of process integration to negative emissions technology portfolios for a system level outlook on these technologies. She has published peer reviewed journals on the topic and co-authored a correspondence article in Nature Computational Science about computing optimal net portfolios. She was awarded multiple best posters and best presentation for her research on this topic. So without further ado, let us all welcome Ms. Maria Victoria Migo Sumaga. Thank you, Professor Ice, for that introduction. Allow me to share my screen. Okay, good morning everyone. And um, I'm always present during the past sustainability lecture series as part of the audience, sometimes the Zoom operator, sometimes the Q&A moderator. But today I'm very happy and honored that I'm the speaker. So it means that I have come a long way in my dissertation and uh, it must signal that hopefully I'm coming uh, I'm in the final stages of my PhD studies. I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Kathleen Aviso and Professor Raymond Tan, and also my examiner, Professor Aris Obando, for the opportunity to speak here. Today, I will be talking about a very relevant topic on the optimization of negative emission technology portfolios using process integration techniques. It's relevant and sometimes scary because it means that climate change is upon us. In fact, the most drastic effect of climate change uh, might be within our lifetimes if we don't if we don't act now. Okay, there is undeniable scientific evidence that 
uh, human-made emissions are causing global warming. And this figure is from the first installment of the sixth assessment report by the IPCC, showing the observed versus the simulated temperature if humans do not emit greenhouse gases. And the evidence is clear. It's been checked by scientific groups all around the world that um, we are headed towards global warming. The effects of global warming are extreme weather events. And as we move from one degree Celsius to higher, the impacts of global warming becomes more severe as shown as the figure in, as in the figure from the Stern Review of 2006. The same IPCC report also tells us the different strategies to achieve emissions reduction. And we have the traditional approaches, including renewable energy, and if fossil fuels will still be used, it should be accompanied by carbon capture and storage. We have demand side measures, improving efficiency. And now we have negative emission technologies or NETs. So, um, NETs remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for storage in a different in environmental compartment. And the IPCC report now indicates that NETs are now needed to counterbalance the hard to abate emissions to reach net zero emissions. So uh, especially because we have difficult to decarbonize industries like aviation, heavy transport, part of agriculture, and we have the steel and cement industries. The idea that carbon dioxide from industrialization actually uh, influences the global temperature has been around since 1938 in the study of Calendar. Uh, but at that time, they thought that global warming was good because it will prevent another ice age and the higher temperatures actually make the agricultural regions in the northern hemisphere more productive. Of course, now we know that uh, we are very far from another ice age and global warming is the opposite of good. It was in 1977 that Dyson proposed afforestation and wetland restoration as the first negative mission technologies. And the principle of NETS, I sometimes call it NETS for short, um, is very simple. The Earth is ruled by carbon cycles as shown in the figure. Our problem is the imbalance between the carbon being released and the carbon being absorbed by the reservoirs. Nets can be low technology like afforestation and enhanced weathering wherein the natural carbon flows are simply enhanced. Or they can be as high technology as direct air capture where adsorbents are used to remove low concentration carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and pump into geological reservoirs. This figure shows the most prominent nets in the literature. So we have, as mentioned, afforestation, afforestation, which enhances the forest as carbon sink. We have soil carbon sequestration, which enhances the soil as carbon sink. And biochar, um, where, uh, which sequesters carbon in the soil in the form of stable carbon, stable biochar. We have bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. I sometimes call it BEX for short, wherein carbon neutral biomass is used for energy. And then the exhaust carbon dioxide is captured and stored. We also have direct air carbon capture and storage, uh, which as I've mentioned, uses um, uh, adsorbents to capture low concentration carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, we have enhanced weathering, which enhances uh, inorganic reactions of rocks to store carbon dioxide as carbonate or bicarbonate ions. And then we have the ocean uh, nets, ocean alkalinization, the liming of the ocean to store it, uh, carbon as bicarbonate ions in the ocean. And we also have ocean fertilization or adding nutrients to the ocean surface to enhance the photosynthetic capability of land. Planktons. So nets can be categorized according to the implementation options, uh, whether or whether it's ocean-based or land-based. 
And I just want to emphasize that there are two motivations behind NETS. One is biophysical and the other is economical. Biophysical because the conventional approaches are not enough. We are way past the point wherein we can reach net zero emissions by conventional approaches alone. Economical because immediate and full decarbonization will also be unlikely. So we need to transition. Uh, recently, we had the COP26 or the Glasgow Climate Pact. And the term that they use is facing down rather than facing out coal, especially for the growing markets of China and India. But what are the challenges in implementing large-scale nets? Nets have different features. They have environmental footprints. That means they will consume resources such as land, water, energy, nutrients, and even budget. So nets have costs, and they would consume resources to deliver the required negative emissions. In large scales, they can even exceed the planetary boundaries. So these are the recommended uh, limits or the safe operating space for land use, water use, etc. Biomass-based nets like afforestation and BECs have um, wide-ranging effects on biogeochemical cycles and their mismanagement and poor implementation may impact water quality, food production, biodiversity, and even livelihoods, according to the IPCC report. Nets have temporal limitations as well. They vary in readiness or the time when uh, they are ready for implementation. Some technologies can be implemented now, like afforestation and soil carbon sequestration, but some will need to be scaled by in the near future or by uh, the mid-century, like BEX and direct air capture. They vary in their lifespans. Some nets have operating uh, lifespans. The biological nets also have what we call the a sink saturation. So uh, that means, uh, like for example, when forests reach their maturity and they stop absorbing additional carbon dioxide. They also have synergistic uh, they also have either trade-offs or synergistic interactions. Uh, synergies occur when two net synergistic nets consume fewer resources when they are implemented together versus when they are implemented individually. Uh, for example, biochar and enhanced weathering uh, rocks can be applied on the same site, so they may share the same supply chain. And um, also, they can... Um, the application, their application on the land growing biomass may consume less fertilizer because these nets can act as soil enhancers. As emerging technologies, they are subject to uncertainties in their performance and cost. Now, um, because no single net can sustainably deliver the required negative emissions, net portfolios at smaller scales are needed. So to consider all of these aspects in the large scale nets deployment, there is a need to simulate, optimize design, select and rank nets, whether individually or as a portfolio. Now, process integration consists of methods that integrate whole processes to reduce consumption and emissions. And uh, the techniques in process integration can be used to perform the tasks that I have mentioned earlier. And this table summarizes the known process integration techniques in carbon and footprint management. We have the graphical techniques, the pinch analysis, pinch analysis and MAC curves or marginal abatement cost curves. Uh, and we also have the mathematical programming approaches, process graph, which is a combination of graphical and mathematical approaches. We also have multi-criteria decision analysis uh, for the selection and ranking of nets. So we can uh, apply these techniques to plan and um, plan the large scale deployment of nets. So no technique is superior, each has its own merit. For example, graphical targeting techniques are good visual communication tools that can provide initial assessments and insights to decision makers, but uh, they can be tedious and limited by accuracy issues. On the other hand, mathematical programming 
can address the complexity and lack of detail in graphical techniques, uh, but at the expense of reduced interactivity. So uh, these various techniques have been applied to nets, uh, and this slide shows the uh, some literature related to that. So, uh, for example, pinch analysis and have been applied to to Bex and also mathematical programming have, have been have been applied to enhanced weathering. So the problem with this um, current literature, they consider single nets, the implementation of single nets, and they do not consider uh, multiple nets in a portfolio, and they seldom consider the other aspects that I've mentioned earlier that are the challenges in implementing nets. So why do we need net portfolios? Because gigaton scale of carbon dioxide removal is needed, there is no single bullet solution, as I've mentioned. Our paper in Nature Computational Science argues that net portfolios at smaller scales are needed to address the risks and sustainability concerns, but there is a computational um, there is a gap in the computational decision support for the strategic deployment of these nets. And this is where my research fills in the knowledge gap. The aim of my research is to develop multi-footprint optimization models using process integration techniques for the large-scale deployment of net portfolios, considering the aspects of uh, nets that I have mentioned earlier. The next slides will show the research dissemination that we did so far. The current slide uh, uses graphical the, the graphical technique marginal abatement cost curves. So in uh, MAC curves, uh, so we also call it MAC for short, for MAC curves, it involves plotting multiple mitigation options on a diagram with the cumulative abatement as the horizontal axis and the vertical abatement, um, sorry, uh, marginal abatement cost as the vertical axis. But for this paper, we replace the um, marginal abatement cost with environmental footprints. So such as uh, land use in this case, but still using the same concept as MAC curves. So the advantage is it clearly shows the trade-off between the negative emissions versus the environmental footprint. And graphical solutions like this are very helpful in communicating uh, with decision makers because of the simplicity and ease in visual communication. In case you are interested to view the publication, I put in the slide the QR code and the link so you can click on, um, you can use the QR code to lead you to the publication. Still using the marginal abatement cost, uh, but this time in planning net zero emissions. Uh, the study on the left used MAC curves as a graphical method, and then we improved the graphical method by including an automated approach. So we incorporated mathematical programming for the automatic targeting of net zero emissions. The beauty of graphical techniques is that uh, they are interactive and can be easily communicated to decision makers, as I've mentioned. So the first, the previous two slides I showed used graphical techniques and um, they have advantages, but of course they have limitations. So the next, uh, slides will use mathematical programming. And the advantage of mathematical programming is they can handle large complex data. And this uh, study here is a single, single period model that minimizes the cost of a net portfolio while meeting the target negative emissions and resource constraints using global scale data. And based from our sensitivity analysis, let me zoom in to this graph. Um, it's interesting because at uh, very at low negative emission targets, 
the technologies that are included in the portfolio are biochar and enhanced weathering. But as we increase the negative emission targets, um, direct air capture becomes included in the portfolio. And the extent of um, its inclusion depends on the uh, negative emission target. So it means that uh, as we increase the target, so for example, as we delay, if we continue to delay our climate action, then the amount of negative emissions that we need to deliver increases, the more reliant we are on direct air capture technologies. So based on this study. The next one is interesting as well. So this also used mathematical programming, uh, but this time we considered synergistic interactions between nets and this one we implemented using the ASEAN data. The study shows that considering synergies in the cost and land use between nets resulted in better solutions in the sense that there's higher, higher negative emissions potential by the portfolio at lower cost. We also presented a multi-period model as a poster entry in last year, uh, last year's NAST scientific poster session. And this time we considered time constraints. If you're interested to view the poster in detail, I have um, put here the QR code for you to follow. Probably an interesting uh, study uh, for you is a. Uh, the preliminary Philippine case study that we presented also last year in the Paase APAMS. The Philippines may benefit from negative emissions due to our economic and energy growth. We are also rich in agricultural and forest residues, which can serve as feedstock for the for biochar and BEX. In terms of geological storage, theoretically, we have over 23 gigatons of carbon dioxide um, in saline aquifers. We also can use the alkaline waste from, uh, as a, from the mining industry. We can use it for enhanced weathering. But one barrier, though, is we have limited um, renewable energy at the present. Nets should use renewable energy to ensure net negative emissions, but the Philippines currently have limited renewable energy. Preliminary results uh, show that if we put a price on carbon, positive, a positive net present value uh, is obtained. And also another finding is that um, the more ready and uh, technologically cheaper options like afforestation and biochar, uh, would sh we should deploy them immediately. But for enhanced weathering and direct air capture, uh, we should deploy them in the near future. So the, the Philippines may benefit if we follow this um, timeline. So this is only a preliminary study. We need more Philippine-specific data of the footprints, cost, and um, resource constraints. Let me quickly share this slide about the ASEAN Net Zero Commitment. For South Southeast Asia, 8 out of 10 countries have net zero targets, excluding Myanmar and the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines' current commitment is a 75% conditional reduction in our business as usual emissions. So we have not yet committed to net zero emissions. But in any case, the country may benefit from negative emission technologies. And I've mentioned earlier about putting a price on carbon. The current 51 US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide, uh, but it varies uh, from region to region. For example, the European Union has a different carbon price. To give you a picture of what is happening today, many companies are targeting net zero emissions. And one way they do this is by buying offsets, some of, some of which come from negative emissions, most popularly through afforestation and reforestation projects. 
Uh, but more and more companies are investing in direct air capture project projects. So there is already a market for these companies that are buying carbon credits, companies that are selling carbon credits, and of course, um, independent companies that are verifying verifying these carbon credits. So using nets and starting a carbon market may open opportunities for the Philippines to trade carbon internationally as internationally as offsets and credits. However, strong policies are needed to ensure that there is true environmental benefit from all of these activities. To summarize and conclude, conclude nets can be used to biophysically and economically achieve net zero. The large scale implementation of nets is challenged by multi footprints, time constraints, uncertainties, trade off, and synergies. And my research is on the multi-footprint optimization models using process integration uh, techniques for the system-level outlook on these technologies. Initial results have been disseminated using global and the ASEAN scale. A preliminary Philippine case study was conducted and the country may benefit from neg negative emissions, but more Philippine-specific data is needed. And also strong policies are needed to in sure through through environmental benefit thank you very much comments and questions are welcome or you may also email me using this email address thank you very much uh, miss ria for your presentation may i invite everyone to let's give uh, our speaker a virtual round of applause okay so now uh, we proceed with the question and answer. Uh, may I invite our participants to ask some questions or some clarifications? Uh, you may type in your questions in our chat box or uh, you may raise your hands uh, for the questions. While we're waiting for our participants for questions, uh, allow me to ask the first uh, question. Well, it's more of a clarification. Um, I'm quite interested uh, in the study that you presented regarding the multi-temporal or multi-period study uh, that you presented in Paase. Uh, can you provide a bit of some details regarding some of the major assumptions uh, you were able to consider in that study and the highlights of your results. Thank you, Professor Ice, for that question. So the model that we presented in Paase, the Philippine case study, uh, was not actually a multi-period model. So some assumptions that we made, uh, for example, uh, we assumed that by the year 2030, we have a surplus renewable energy. But that is quite a, uh, right now, that is not what's happening in the Philippines. Because in the Philippines, we consume the renewable energy first before we turn uh, to the fossil fuel. So the renewable energy gets consumed first. Uh, but for nets, we need the surplus renewable energy. That's why we need to ramp up our renewable energy to ensure that nets would have net negative emissions. So that's one of the assumptions that uh, we mm -hmm. made. And also, of course, uh, we assume that um, the size of the geological storage based on the study by the ASEAN De Development Bank. So those are some examples. Thank you for that, uh, Ms. Ria. So let me see if there are any other questions or clarification. Okay, we have... Yeah, I think we have one from Professor Biswajit Sarkar. Uh, what type of technology is used? Ah, okay, as T in NET. Mm. I, I see... Uh, there are different types of uh, nets. Um, for example, a first station, a first station. We have bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Uh, we have biochar application to soil, enhanced weathering, etc. So nets is just 
or negative emission technologies is like um, an umbrella term that covers all of these technologies. And their goal is to take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it away from the atmosphere in another environmental compartment, like, for example, in biomass, in soil, in the ocean, underground. So, and also we have nets that can be stored in the built environment, in the buildings themselves, like in concrete. So it's just a general term that includes all of these kinds of technologies. Uh, I think he has a follow-up question. Is it a combination of several technologies? Um, they can be implemented individually. However, uh, there's a risk and sustainability concern with that. For example, if we just focus on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, then there's a risk that um, in the food and water security, because of course we have to grow the biomass that we'll be using for bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. That's why um, net portfolios or a combination of different technologies is better because it addresses the risk and sustainability concerns uh, because they are in smaller scales. So it's better to if we have multiple technologies in a portfolio. Okay. Well, uh, that's a very good a question. <laughs> okay, yeah. If I separate them. Um, my research is about integrating, integrating all of these technologies um, in a portfolio. So what I did was I considered their multi-footprints, uh, meaning I set limits in the in the resource. So there are res in my model, there are resource constraints. For example, only this amount of energy or this amount of land and water. And then I put in the different technologies and my, the model optimized uh, which technologies should have this um, capacity. So that is the goal of my research, to optimize the portfolio of technologies. Thank you very much also for that uh, question. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think we have um, one more, uh, a time for one more question or clarification. Uh, there's a question from Umakanta. Are you focusing on waste? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, right now, uh, I did not consider the waste products in my in my model, but that's a good suggestion for future work. Okay, thank you for that question. Any more uh questions and I have, I have a question that yes, maybe uh, I'm Ria or somebody else can, can, Ravi, know, so go ahead. can comment on actually it's just um uh, maybe a controversial question um I just read somewhere that uh by using the term negative emissions uh so sometimes the the way it is understood by the public is the opposite because you've used the term negative so I don't know if you've experienced anything like that during your presentations when you were trying to um, yeah, mention negative emissions, but the connotation of the general public or someone who's not so familiar is that it is a technology that is not good because you are <laughs> because you're doing negative. You know. So what, what can you say about that? Do you have any comments? Uh, so far, I have not encountered any questions on or any comment about the word negative. <laughs> um, maybe because I, I always explain the, the meaning of negative emission technologies, which is they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, but it's good to know, uh, Dr. K, <laughs> that um, there are some people who have a negative connotation with NETS. Maybe we can clarify to them uh, the real meaning of NETS. Dr. Yeah. Tan has a comment. Yes. So we, they use carbon dioxide removal. So maybe that's a better mm. term, carbon dioxide removal. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Aviso. Any other questions uh, for our speaker?
Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, uh, uh, again, let's give uh, Ms. Ria uh, a virtual round of applause uh, for sharing her study uh, in this lecture series. So thank you so, so much, uh, Ms. Ria, uh, for presenting in the first lecture series for this year. Thank you very much as well, especially to my supervisors, Professor Imantan, Professor Aviso, and to Professor Aris as my examiner. My this preview. Paper. <laughs> it's a preview. It's a preview. Of my defense. It's a preview of her Viva. <laughs> okay, so uh, now that uh, we already have uh, jump-started the lecture series, allow me to share again my screen. Uh, and uh, showcase uh, our next uh, lecture, uh, which is scheduled on April 26, 2023, uh, which is entitled Socio-Ecological Network Modeling of Agroecosystems, Prospects for Enhanced Decision-Making Towards Sustainable Pest Management. And our invited speaker uh, for this lecture is Associate Professor Dr. Billy Joel Almarines of De La Salle University. So you are uh, invited uh, to this lecture. Uh, you may register using the QR code as uh, shown in this slide. Okay, but before we officially end or adjourn our lecture for today, uh, may I also invite you to provide us some feedback to further improve uh, the delivery of this lecture series. And um, you can access the QR code, the feedback form through the U QR code as shown here. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for today's lecture series and we hope to see you again on April uh, for the next uh, lecture presentation. Again, thank you so much from the organizing committee. Thank you for coming and we'll see you again on the next lecture series. All right, bye for now.